वेलकम बैक एवरी वन वी नाउ स्टार्ट विथ आर सेकेंड सेट ऑफ सेशन विच विल बी चेयर्ड बाय डॉक्टर पूनम शाह मैम शी इज अ पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट इन मेडिसिन फ्रॉम बी जे मेडिकल कॉलेज पुणे एंड अ पायनियर बेरियाट्रिक फिजिशियन इन इंडिया शी इज द फाउंडर डिरेक्टर ऑफ लैप्रो ओबीसो सेंटर एंड इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ऑफ एक्सिलेंस फॉर बेरियाट्रिक सर्जरी एंड हैज मेनी पब्लिकेशन एज वेल एज अवॉर्ड्स टू हर क्रेडिट She is a founder trustee of Defeat Diabetes and Obesity Foundation which is active in conducting public awareness programs and camps. Her efforts to popularize the bariatric medicine in India were recognized by the All India Association of Advancing Research of Obesity and was honored with the oration for the year 2017. It is my honor to invite on stage Dr. Poonam Shah ma'am. and i request her to introduce our first speaker professor lindsay brown i thank you for the introduction and i thank dr rally for inviting me uh, to this wonderful academic um, event and also to symbiosis and we are very proud of vidya who is my schoolmate and my college mate for the wonderful uh, growth has done in the education sector so friends uh, welcome to the post lunch uh, session we'll be talking about food and so the first uh, talk is on functional foods for treating metabolic syndrome which will be given by professor lindsay brown and uh, he's from the school of health and wellbeing university of southern queensland Uh, which is in australia he received his phd from the university of sydney in 1981 he was professor of biomedical sciences at the school of biomedical sciences university of southern queensland australia as well as the manipal uh, college of pharmaceutical sciences manipal university india his research work has mainly focused on rat models that uh, adequately mimic cardiovascular and endocrine uh, diseases he has over 180 publications and special issue contributions in reputed international journals he has been awarded more than 2 million dollars grants from uh, ngos australian state and federal governments as grant support for his research group He has played a vital role in guiding several PhD and MPhil research projects. He has served as an editor for European Journal of Clinical Investigation, a reviewer for around 25 international journals, and for grant applications from Australia and New Zealand, and a member of the NHMRC project grant review panels and uh, 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 the Asagnas Academy 2015 and 2016. His contributions are also extended to excellence of research. in australia medical and health sciences research evaluation committee in 2012 and usq excellence in research award 2015 so welcome professor thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here um and also now that you've all had lunch i can talk about what you should have had for lunch so something different Okay, when the slide comes up. Okay, the in general the title will be functional foods for treating metabolic syndrome. Now metabolic syndrome is a very broad disorder and it's also remarkably common. What we've looked at is a range of foods and most of those are in that picture there and obviously out my background is heart cardiovascular research. The University of Southern Queensland is in Toowoomba, it's about 130 kilometers or so west of Brisbane. The first slide is maybe the most important of the whole day because these are the people that actually do the work so that I can come and let them have a, a peaceful time for a week or so while while I'm here. As you will notice from there we have a range of students from a range of backgrounds i think the largest group there happens to come from maharashtra nikhil bandaka is from nagpur as is ashwini sharma sunil panchal is my postdoc he's also from nagpur and kiran um nahali is from nashik um naga is from uh, guntur uh oliver 
from uh, Sabac, uh, Fernanda from Brazil. And there is, we must have, yes, we do have an Australian. We have a couple of Australians. So you, know, you never know. You've got to have a bit of everything. Um, and I mean, they're, they're really good students. They're wonderful students. And that's why um, we can actually you know, say the things we're saying. One of the key points, though, before we go on to the science, one of the key points is that we have to be able to tell our community about the work that we do and about why it is important. This photo, so Sunil Panchal is my postdoc, explaining to our Chief Minister, Anastasia Palaszczuk, and the Health Minister, Cameron Dick, about one of the compounds I'll mention, the plum juice. And that was because he was awarded a fellowship, a state government fellowship, um, to do the work in that. And so as the Chief Minister, she was really interested in that. That's critically important. It doesn't have to be Chief Ministers. Not only Chief Ministers are worth talking to, but it's actually, it's actually worth going back to the schools that you came from, for example, and talk to the students a couple of years younger than you about what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's relevant. Talk to the local newspapers. We've been on TV, we've been on Australia-wide TV actually. We've been in local TV, we've been on newspapers, we've even been on newspapers in Lucknow, thanks to Professor Marty. And I couldn't read a word of what was in there. <laughs> but it must have been good. But this is really important to actually going out to the community, to your community, and tell them why what you are doing is really important to them. Toowoomba is about, if I can focus on here, is about, is that red dot there, I think. What you'll see from that top slide is that the vast majority of Australia has less than 0 0.1 people per square kilometre, I think it is, yes. So less than one person every 10 square kilometres. That's somewhat lower than the density in India. <laughs> somewhat. So that's that whole area there. So basically Australia has three major cities, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, and that is something like 60% of the population of the country. It's 1,000 kilometres between those cities. Toowoomba is the biggest inland city in Australia except for Canberra. It has about 130,000 people. It's the garden city. There's a carnival of flowers every year. The university has a Japanese garden which is very, not very peaceful. The university itself is relatively small. It's a regional university. And one of the key benefits of a regional university is firstly it's not world famous, but secondly we can actually interact w better, I think, with our community. We can talk to our community. We can say to them, well, wait a minute, what are you interested in? Can we help you with that? And to me, that's really important. We're a centre of an agricultural area. So it looks rather different from India, but the same purpose. So that is sorghum, red sorghum. Um, I've forgotten the Hindi word for it. Joa, that's right. Um, and, by the way, my command of Hindi is about three or four words, none of which belong together in a sentence. <laughs> but also the vegetables, there's some purple carrots in there, which I'll come back to, grapes, of course, and then a whole range of fruit and vegetables grown in our area, but also grown in this type of area as well. So if we go on to India now, tropical India in particular, because that's where we are, so if we look at the, the light green is the tropical dry area, that's arid. The dark green is the tropical wet area. And there's an awful lot of India in there. And so this will produce an awful range, an incredible range of products. Are these useful? Can these be used as medicines? Well, that's what we'll look at. Now, we, you've got your tropical beaches, they're fantastic. Um, but we'll look at more at the coconuts. 
We'll look at the seaweeds. That is the capophycus that we'll, we'll be looking at. That was at Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu. There's an amazing range of tropical fruits of which we know very little. And then, of course, one of the key things of South India is Nilgiri with coffee. Metabolic syndrome affecting maybe 40%, maybe even more than that. Certainly in cities like Mumbai, maybe up to 50 to 60% of the population. This is an amazing percentage. Absolutely amazing. The characteristics are on this corner. So this is some US figures here. And blood pressure, they increase blood pressure, increase triglycerides, um, and obviously obesity as well. But those are the characteristic uh, five things that make up the metabolic syndrome. And that all sounds, well, you know, low, uh, uh, low HDL cholesterol, visceral obesity, insulin resistance, hypertension, high triglycerides. Oh, that can't be that harmful, can it? Look at the range of disease states that related to overweight, um, obese patients. Which organ doesn't it affect? And in the long term, it will damage every single organ in the body. And what I want to do firstly is actually mention a little bit on arthritis. But uh, first of all, the model. What we do is feed rats a high carbohydrates, so a high fructose, and high saturated fat, beef tallow, in their diet. And they become obese and hypertensive and fatty liver and all the hormones go the wrong way, so the insulin resistance, all of these things happen as in humans. One difference, you cannot produce atherosclerosis in rats. Rats have high HDL and low LDL, so they have the privilege of not getting atherosclerosis. We start with rats about 335, 340 gram, feed them for 16 weeks, do all the end terminal experiments on the biochemistry, on the heart function, on then for histology. But we'll go in at eight weeks of that diet and give the intervention. So this is a reversal protocol, not a prevention protocol, for a very simple reason. Patients do not go to the doctor. They do not go to the, to the specialist in diabetes or obesity before they're obese. They are sent by the family and saying, we want you to survive a bit longer, go and see a doctor. So if we are going to mimic that in our models, it has to be a reversal protocol, not a prevention protocol. That's why we go in th at that stage. Now these rats, if we look at the body weight at the top there, the control rats um, increase body weight as they, as they grow, as they age, obviously. Look at the difference. So we have there something like almost 200 gram, 150 gram difference in body weight. In a 500 gram rat, that's what, 30% difference, 30% of fat. We can do very simple measurements, you know, measure the abdominal circumference. Now we can do all sorts of measurements and to measure fat, but when we go out and talk in the community, if we talk about visceral fat, everyone's going to look at them saying, typical academic no touch with reality. Talk about waist circumference, everyone knows what you're talking about. The communication is critical. In these animals, whoops, in these animals, the interferon, uh, interferon gamma goes up, the IL-1 beta goes up, and the IL-10 goes down, so classic low-grade inflammation. This was in, we published this in PLUS One a couple of months ago. But what happens to the bones? We don't often think of bones in obesity. We think of the cardiovascular disease, we think of the metabolic disorders, but look what happens to the bones. So in the, the cartilage and the synovium. So in the cartilage, so eight weeks up there, 16 weeks. So that's the growing part, the cartilage. Looks quite normal after eight weeks, but look what happens after 16 weeks that cartilage is really severely damaged. We also have done, I think it's a slide coming up later, showing the osteoblasts go down and the osteoclasts go up. 
If we look at the synovium, there's the normal one, the control animals. After eight weeks, there's some damage. After 16 weeks, it's basically destroyed. Long-term damage? Of course there is. And that's simply from a high-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. And they're the actual numbers down the bottom there. And this is one that I don't really understand, but I hope there's some immunologists that can look at that and say, oh, that's perfectly obvious. But what is the, this is characterizing the macrophages in the synovial fluid. In the control diet, they are a, an M2 phenotype. In the high carbohydrate, high fat, they're an M1 phenotype, so they're inflammatory. That's where the problem starts. So it is a diet-induced problem. If we look at foods as a potential medicine for metabolic syndrome, so this was a review, you can see Sunil's name up there, another student from Sikkim, Hemant Powjal and myself, published that in 2015 on, as a review of functional foods. I'll come back to the definition in a minute. Functional foods as potential therapeutic options. If you read that last paragraph in that abstract, the concept that these fruits and vegetables will act as functional foods in humans to reduce obesity and therefore improve health claims, or improve health, remains intuitive and possible rather than proven. It's a great idea. It sounds logical. It sounds fantastic. But without the evidence, that's all it is. We as scientists, as, as physicians, as practitioners, as healthcare practitioners, need to provide the evidence. Without the evidence, all it is is a nice story for the magazines, for the newspapers or whatever. No use. We need the evidence. So functional foods, first one there, coconut. Functional foods, foods that can be used to prevent or reverse disease states. Yes, they provide nutrition as well. But on top of providing nutrition, they can prevent or reverse disease states. Coconut. And this is, you can read at the top there, Plant Foods for Human Nutrition, November last year. Coconut products improve signs of diet-induced metabolic syndrome in rats. And just the numbers there, virgin coconut oil, lowered body weight. Blood, blood glucose concentration, systolic blood pressure, diastolic stiffness, or the stiffness of the heart, with improved structure and function of the heart and liver. What's more, what more is there? That just about defines everything that we want to do in the cardiovascular and metabolic uh, area. Something as simple as coconut oil. Let's see what it actually does to the bone. So these were rats fed, instead of with the beef tallow, they had the same amount of lauric acid, so the saturated fat that's in coconut. Look at the changes. So the cartilage, the control animals, the cartilage, the osteoblasts, measured by that one, the osteoclast, measured by that. So in the normal bone, there's good-sized cartilage, there's plenty of osteoblasts to form the, the cells, and there's relatively few that are breaking it down. Now we'll jump to this side and look at palmitic acid. So these are both saturated fats. So all saturated fats are the same if you look at the, the organic chemistry. If you look at the biology, there's enormous differences between them. So labeling something as a saturated fat and then saying, therefore in the body it will do, is bad science. And it's wrong as well. If we look there, the cartilage has markedly reduced. There's hardly any osteoblasts and there's m many more osteoclasts. Look at the lauric acid. Same 20% in the diet. Same as that, same as with the fat rats. Look at the difference. Cartilage normal, osteoblast normal, osteoclast normal. So it does make a difference which fat is in the diet. It makes an absolute difference to the structure and therefore the function of the bone simply by changing which saturated fat is in the diet. Why is that important in India? The biggest import of oil is palm oil. 
What does palm oil contain? Palmitic acid. So is that import, a question I can't answer by the way, is that import simply setting the stage for an epidemic of osteoarthritis in 20 years time? Don't know. That evidence would suggest that it's a good chance. Purple fruits. Purple fruits contain anthocyanins and we've looked at those anth anthocyanins. So for example, we've looked at the a variety of plum that's grown in Australia, uh, developed in Australia, a Queen Garnet plum. We've looked at the purple carrots. How many of you have bought purple carrots here in India? How many of you have seen them? How many of you come from Punjab? Same number, okay. Because they grow, they, they grow well in this country. Purple maize, whoops. Purple maize is one of the varieties, the old, the ancient varieties from South America. Mangosteen, the white part is the eaten, is eaten. The purple part has all the goodness in it. So what do we do with that? Throw it on the rubbish bin. Could it be used? It would be a product um, that yeah, you, you're producing a or could produce a valuable product from what is now waste. Good concept? Wonderful concept. And you've noticed I've gone all around there and missed the obvious one. And the obvious one is because that's something that comes from your area. And it is? Kokum. Garcinia indica. Uh, is Kokum Hindi or Marathi? Both. Oh, that solves the problem, doesn't it? The, the two languages do have something in common. Um, where are the studies? It contains the same compounds, by the way. The anthocyanins. I had an glucoside and there's another sugar, sambubiocide, in there. It contains the same compounds. Where are the studies on that? They don't exist. Where is the product? Um, Dr. Shapalka, I don't think is here at the moment, but at Baramati, there are a number of factories producing it. Is it used for health? Does anyone even know it? No, not pomegranate. Pomegranate is. Pomegranates have elagitanins as well. But this is the, the anthocyanins. So you've got one of these products basically on your back doorstep. Not literally, but basically on your back doorstep. Not being used. Does that make sense? Well, what do these anthocyanins do? And we've done a number of these in different anthocyanins and basically we get the same results. So this is the example. So with the Queen Garner Plums, there's the fat rats, the red ones always. The treatment at eight weeks, look at the difference there. No difference in the control ones. Look at the blood pressure difference. So no change in diet, they're still getting a junk food diet with purple, uh, the queen gun of plum juice added to it. Look what it's done to the blood pressure. Brought it back to normal without changing the diet evidence. We look at the uh, plasma lipids. So the red ones being the fat ones. So the cholesterol, the triglycerides, NEFA, all going up. And after the eight weeks treatment, the green one, you can see for yourself. It's basically back to normal without changing that diet. The plasma liver enzymes, I think it's AST, goes up about double, so it's certainly not liver failure or anything, but it goes up, it's damage, and it's basically back to normal. This is a plum juice. This is not a billion dollar white powder from some international drug company. This is plum juice. What does it do to the structure and function? And th this tells us about a mechanism. So in the heart, down the bottom. Inflammatory cells in the fat rats, lots of inflammatory cells, those darker ones there, they're gone. 
So that's the queen garnet plum juice, that's cyanide and glucoside itself. Hardly any inflammatory cells left. That's the definition of an anti-inflammatory compound. In a situation where you expect inflammatory cell infiltration and you give the drug and there's none there, visual evidence of an anti-inflammatory effect. Yes, we can measure C-reactive peptide and all things like this as well, and they go down too. But there's the visual evidence. A picture's worth a thousand words. Academics will still use the thousand words, by the way. In the liver, the fat um, in the cells, the liver shouldn't be a place to store fat. But in these it is. Where is it? Now the fat is gone. So the liver cells have improved, the heart has improved, the function has improved, the plasma lipids have improved. That's the evidence. It's not the only one. Davidson's plum you would have never heard of. It's an indigenous fruit in Australia. It looks rather different the way it grows. But an indigenous uh, fruit, and we've done some work on that as well. Whoops. The blood pressure goes back to normal. The total abdominal fat, uh, using DEXA,